Jock and Roxanne, are you there? Right. We are. Hey, how's it going? Great. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. I was just right. running through some questions here. I didn't get through, as usual, I never get through all the ones I want to, but I can probably relay some of these back to you guys. I know there was a few of them that were actually addressed towards you. Here's a question from a forum member. And apparently, about two weeks ago, you made a comment, Jacques, about philosophy, psychology, and psychiatry, and you were denoting how they had a certain degree of irrelevancy to society. And this person wanted clarification on, on that point. Do you know his context? Uh, I do recall that. Okay. I think that the best way I can answer that is mm-hmm. it seems that psychologists and uh, psychiatrists work on the individual. Right. And I really believe their problems are generated by the environment, the culture they're reared in. Uh, I really believe that working on the individual is sort of ass backwards. You really have to alter the society that produces the kind of values that are aberrant, that, that make it difficult for people to relate to one another. I believe that that is somewhat deliberate in our educational system. Uh, I go along with the concept of Einstein that said that he felt patriotism is a disease in that it separates people and it doesn't help us understand the contributions made by other nations. Our major problem, if I can tackle that now, is, is really that the difference between science and politics. In politics, you have a lot of usually businessmen or lawyers trying to work out a system in which no research is done at all. If you get into the physical sciences, what they do is they come up with a concept of structure, and then they test that concept. They twist the structure, pull it apart, And if they're putting up a building, they precast the concrete and put it in the compression machine to see what kind of loading it can stand. If they make an airplane, they study aerodynamics, how the air flows over the wing and the body in order to arrive at an operating system. But in politics, it's as old as time. They sit around discussing things and then never put the test And so politics really can't go anywhere because it doesn't deal with anything. It deals with opinions, feelings, which are great 200 years ago. But today, we really have to work with a different system. And the system that I'm about to talk about is the procedural system of the Venus Project. In other words, instead of designing buildings and putting people in them and houses, What we design is an entire system. So the city itself is based on the carrying capacity of the environment. So is the whole project. In other words, as we bring nations together to work as a cooperative team on the earth, take care of the environment, restore the oceans, rebuild the reefs, and restructure our education so it's relevant to conditions that threaten people. Instead of killing one another, as they do in wars, as politicians usually conclude, we would train people or educate people to become good at problem solving. So what we have to do is learn how to bridge the difference between nations, not kill. Killing is a very old solution. It never worked. It always produced hatred and resentment and destruction and pollution in the environment. There's just no limit to the amount of pollution if we get into another military conflict. So the military conflict is a supreme failure of nations to bridge the difference. And I feel that the only way you can do that, bridge the difference between nations, is to make them part of a global system in which all of the world's resources are shared by all the world's people. As long as you've got separate nations that control resources or the greater deal of the world's resources, you are going to have trouble. All nations want a piece of the pie, and that's your problem. 
The same with labor unions. Labor unions are very good for labor, but if the price that they demand goes up, the price of the car goes up. So labor unions are interested in getting a piece of the pie. I'm interested in all people getting a piece of the pie, not fighting for any group. I'm not interested in women's rights, Jewish rights, Polish rights. I think that all people should have free access to the necessities of life without servitude or debt of any kind. Anything less than that will be a continuation of the same problems we've had for centuries. In fact, that we've had the same problems for hundreds of years, and normal people are brought up to believe that that's human nature, because the conditions have always been that of scarcity, deprivation, and artificiality. One of the major forms of artificiality would be the concept of a free society or a democratic society. You've never had a democratic society. In a truly democratic society, you would hear all points of view on Sunday, all concepts of religion, different concepts, different presentations, including atheism, agnosticism, and it would be up to the American people to turn it off. But when you've got one point of view on the air, every broadcasting company, remember, has vested interest. They depend on funding for advertising, and they sell corporate interest. So how are they going to be objective? You have military people on the air and all the major broadcasting companies talking about the war. You don't have sociologists, social scientists, social psychologists giving their point of view. Of course you don't realize what's missing because you've never heard the truth. The truth is that we've never had democracy. In a democratic society, all children will be given the best of education without a price tag. In a democratic society, all children would have access to nutritious food. In a truly democratic society, you would hear all points of view. Just as if a person accuses you of something, you have the right to face your accuser in court. When our president talks against another nation, you should invite the prime minister of that nation to give his point of view. We don't have to agree with it. Then we should invite the prime minister of Sweden, who says they're both wrong. This is how I see it. That would be a democratic society. Every point of view on the air. You've never had that, and you will not have that as long as you stress the free enterprise or the monetary system. Any conversations other than that which supports the monetary system would be a threat to the system. Even the army is artificial. Even the war is artificial. Most wars are not about bringing democracy to other nations. It's about resources. It's about oil, or it's about cheap labor, or it's nothing to do with democracy. In fact, if you really think about it, you find that you can't go to a country where people have an established system, whatever that is, where they have 10 wives or 15 wives. You can't verbally change them. They've been that way for hundreds of years. So the only way to bridge the difference between nations is not through military systems. It's by sharing that which we have in common. All nations need clean air, clean water, arable land, good nutrition, and a relevant education. So you start with the areas we have in common. Eventually, all people will pick up technology because it's the only thing that can add to their culture and minimize the amount of stress and give us more time to spend with our families. Through technology, through machines, we can do away with repetitive, boring jobs, which most people hate. And in that way, we can send people back to school to study things that become relevant to problem solving. Imagine if all the soldiers, instead of trained to be killing machines, they were trained to be problem solvers. What a wonderful world we can have. When you think of all the money nations spend on military and defense systems, which are of no use at all, produce nothing valuable for people. They say, well, it advances electronics. That's not true. We don't put up appropriations to advance electronics. Why don't we do that? 
because it's not good business. In military systems, you have to update all the equipment, all the airplanes, all the submarines, all the battleships have to be updated. So there's a hell of a lot of money in war. If war were real, they would never conscript the lives of young men to serve their country. They would conscript all the war industries for the duration of the war and then give it back to industry after the war. Just like a soldier puts up his life for this country, no one should make profit out of war. I mean selling machine guns, submarines, aircraft, all that is big business. And as long as that exists, the war is ultimately corrupt. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> Very well stated. Thank you for that. One of the things that I wanted to bring up to you, I've been learning a lot about uh, advanced technologies and, and cyber nation and nanotechnology. And one thing I've realized is that when it comes to war, these things can be used against us. They can be used in ways that are extremely negative. It's almost as though we have a race against time before the war industry begins to use cybernated machines, begins to use self-replicating machines for its own means. Do you feel that's a real threat? A real threat is ignorance. Sure. A public that's not informed or well-educated is a threat. And that goes for all the nations. All the nations of the world try to bring up their people to uphold established institutions. But if you work today for an electronics firm, they don't want you to turn out the same product. They want you to make your product faster. I'm talking about laptops that store more information and less space, lighter in weight. All technology is in a constant state of rapid change, whereas our political systems they keep pounding into your head democracy and freedom. That means no change. If you have a fixed concept of society, it means you're on the way out. The nation that has no vision of what the future can be is bound to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And if we fail to grasp the significance of organized science working for the benefit of all the world's people, not for some private institution, once you realize that, you will see great advances made in society. Just imagine how foolish we are. We try to dig up nickels and dimes for research in heart disease or care packages for people injured in earthquakes. But when war comes, we produce everything, all kinds of killing machines without any worry about cost or price. Don't you see how corrupt that is, how obviously corrupt that is? Why don't we build better universities? Why don't we teach people how to relate to one another, update our language so there's no argument in it? You know, the Bible, people read the Bible, but the language written in the Bible is subject to interpretation. A person reads it and says, I think Jesus meant this, and another person disagrees. So you got a divided kind of religion. The Seventh-day Adventists, the Catholics, the Protestant, all of these groups. Uh, a divided church is no church at all. Don't you see, as long as your language is subject to interpretation, there's no basis for communicating. Now, there is a language, or many languages, that are not subject to interpretation. Chemistry, mathematics, physics, structural engineering. When engineers talk to each other, they don't talk in terms, that's a nice bridge. They give the tensile strength, the compression strength, the torsional strength of metals, the composition of metals. So the language of science appears to be universal. When we send a blueprint to China or Japan, they don't turn out what they think you mean. The blueprint has all specifications on it, the tolerances, the kind of parts, the metallurgy, everything related to the product. So obviously, if there is a language that's not subject to interpretation, as long as we don't use that language, we're going to have trouble. That's why law as a field or profession works, because they can take language and turn it around, do whatever they want to do with it in the future, the honored professions of today would be considered criminal. Lawyers would be considered criminals. Judges would be considered criminals. Or you got people that you admire, like King Solomon had a thousand wives. He'd be arrested today as a bigamist. 
Because they say, whatever you hold up as a criminal doesn't make sense. Investment banking is criminal. The banking institutions are socially offensive and criminal. All private institutions are criminal. Privatizing industry is criminal. Privatizing schools would be criminal. The public domain is the most important thing. How well educated people are, how healthy they are, how rich their lives are, and this is what the Venus Project concerns itself with, the well-being of all the world's people. That's fantastic. I think, uh, I think that's the most important point to get across, that's for sure. There have been a lot of people speaking about the transition. In Zeitgeist Addendum, you mentioned how they're not going to give up the monetary system. The monetary system must fail. What kind of problems do you see arising in the course of this transition, and can you, can you be specific with it? Yes, a, a rapid rate in crime, hmm. uprisings of minorities, and then police putting in, or lawyers or government people putting in new laws, such as uh, certain people have to be in the house by 9 o'clock, they're not supposed to be walking around at night. They're going to try to manage the disruptions caused by the free enterprise system. By the way, if you're not aware of this, the money that was given to banks are the, is the same people that created the problem. So it means they really do control the country. You think you got a new administration in there. That's only an illusion, just like democracy is an illusion. It's always an illusion if people don't have access to nutritious food, if they can't afford it. If they can't afford medical care, then the word democracy has no meaning at all. Think about those things. In other words, I'm not out to hurt anybody or kill anybody. I'm just talking about all civilizations go through transitions. They're always emerging. And the concept of the transition means as we learn new things in technology, we apply it. We apply it militaristically. It is unfortunate that any single nation goes out into space because I can assure you it's only a matter of time that nuclear weapons will be moving around out there or stationary orbiting the Earth ready to drop on any nation that doesn't behave in the way we consider correct. So we're not sane enough nor wise enough yet to use our technology for the benefit of all the world's people. You know, we don't have the wisdom. We are good technically. We know electronics. We know how to construct tall buildings. But we haven't learned how to share life experiences we haven't learned how to find meaning in our own life, how to relate to one another in a meaningful way, and what love really means. We haven't learned that. We are not civilized yet. And this whole notion of a quest for intelligent life in outer space, we don't even have intelligent life on Earth yet. And would you know intelligent life if you saw it? I don't think anyone would know what to look for. There are people that call themselves truth seekers. In order to seek the truth, you'd have to know everything. So how can you be a truth seeker if you're brought up in a given culture with a set of values that you think are appropriate or that your society tries to tell you is the greatest in the world, the greatest country in the world? God bless America. Who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? If God made everybody, you have no business destroying any other country. Great points, absolutely. Um, one thing that came up in my research recently is about 60 years ago, those that were aware of technological unemployment used to talk about how we would begin to reduce the work week and the hours that people work during the day. Do you think this will happen? Why should they do that? Right. In other words, there are engineers called time and motion studies. They get more motion and less time out of people. It's very good for industry, but not good for the working man. The stress levels are higher. Marines, when they're being trained, they sing songs which are already prepared called Blood Makes the Grass Grow. They sing while they're marching so they won't be thinking of other things. That's a hell of a technique for mind control. Military people really believe, I'm talking about people in the Pentagon, they really believe they're there to defend the country. 
The way you defend the country is by designing out problems. The way you defend the country is by bridging the difference between nations, by cutting back on armament, by restoring the oceans and the reefs, and cleaning the air, and restoring nature to as near a natural condition as possible. This is true national defense, not military systems. I wish I could address the Pentagon. I think the guys in it are sincere, but I think they're distorted by the culture they live in. They think they're doing a public service. You know, if we have another war, or if you don't understand this, America has 300 submarines. Each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. Now, what can you accomplish with that? Tell me. I'd like to know. I completely agree with you. There's, it's There's another thing. They have built a special place for senators and congressmen. It's under a mountain, and it has food for six months. Refrigeration, lights, electric generators. What do you come out to after six months? A radioactive planet? How stupid can you be? In other words, I'm trying to tell you that there's a limitless dimensions to human stupidity if they're not well informed. They will drive themselves into the ground, destroy the environment, the atmosphere. We are not sane enough yet to use technology wisely. One thing I thought was great last I spoke with you, you mentioned the idea of security and the, in the fallacy of security. Would you comment on this obsession that our current culture has with security? Yeah, security is as long as there's no tornadoes to rip your house apart in 20 minutes. As long as the banks don't fail again, and so everything you work for is gone, even though you want to send your kids to college, the threat of unemployment threatens that, even though you'd like to send your kids to college. So you live in a system, a very predatory system, where people make a buck of human misery. In other words, if somebody bangs in your car, somebody makes money straightening out the fenders. If you need a root canal job, you might have to pay over $1,000 to have it done. And if you get medically very ill, cancer, it'll wipe out all your savings. So the whole notion of security is really an illusion put out there to keep you going. You people have been deprived of the real meaning of education, and that is learning how to live, learning how to find meaning in your own life, learning how to pursue the things you are interested in instead of the best years of your life working for a, a corporation. The minute you punch your time clock to go into any American industry, you're walking into a dictatorship. They tell you, you know, well, you don't want to live in a dictatorship. What do you think you're living in? If you don't show up on time, you lose your job. If you don't work eight hours a day and do your job, you discharge. You don't participate. But they tell you you live in a participatory democracy. How many of you out there voted for the Vietnam War? How many of you voted for the space program? How many of you voted for the highways and bridge designs? You don't participate at all. That's an illusion. Bridge engineers do bridges. People that study tunnels and transportation work on those problems. Aircraft are designed by aircraft companies, not the public. Where do you participate? You think you elect people to political office? That's an illusion. The people you vote for are selected by the establishment. And if they don't carry out the game of the establishment, they are soon removed or assassinated. Think about it. Yes, indeed. And those patterns are constant uh, across the world. Um, to change gears a little bit, I wanted to ask a question from a forum member in regard to distribution methods that might be utilized. And we've touched upon this, but could you briefly explain how, you're how do distribution methods will work? Yes, because the proof of the work is when we go to war, we have millions of people in the Army who are all over the world, and we distribute food, clothing to all of them without a problem. Good point. Except a lot of ships are sunk at sea on the way, but we still can produce enough food to feed all the millions of men in the Army. Why can't we do that in peace? Why can't we build hospitals for the poor? Why can't we take care of the world? There's problems. Don't you see that the smarter the children are today, the richer the world of tomorrow? 
every child deprived of nutritious food, every child hanging out in malls. That's where you find high school kids today. They hang out in malls because there's no art centers, no music centers, no cultural centers they can afford to go to. So I would say the higher the quality of the intelligence of all people, the richer the world. Deprivation spreads and it deprives us of, of true progressive knowledge. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, here's an interesting question. A lot of people, they, they, they wonder, they, they are so conditioned by this current culture that they have no idea what the world would even be like after the transition. And the question is, what would the problems be after we transition into the Venus Project? The new language it has reference. For example, let me tell you how terrible our language is today. Okay. We, uh, we say things like, have a nice weekend. You know, why don't you say, have a nice life? Go all the way. Right. <laughs> Do you understand? And we say, we say um, have a nice vacation. Have a nice life. Go all the way. In other words, our churches even bless our war tanks. This is all anti-Christ. Right. Most of the churches today, not all of them, have become business institutions. They always need money for Jesus, or God needs money. God doesn't need any money. This is a human concept. Humans invent that to take care of their own establishment. Now, Jesus, as I understood the man, he would have dinner with the poor, he would work with the poor, with the prostitute, with the beggars. If people try to stone another person, they would say, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. The nation that is completely free of corruption does not exist. We stole this land from the Indians. We took California and New Mexico by force and violence. Definition of a criminal, one who removes an object from your possession without your permission. That's exactly what we did after we won the war. We kidnapped the German engineers and took their rockets and took whatever we needed from them and brought it here to the United States and put some of the top German engineers in charge of the rocket programs. So when you get mad at somebody and you want to kill them, you don't do that because that's against the law. But when a nation gets mad at another nation, there's mass killing, more than would have been if you would shoot your neighbor if you disagreed with them. The nations themselves are the biggest killing machines that ever existed. Although they quote the Bible, they go to church, but once the nation says, there's your enemy out there, the church itself, if it begins to say, just a minute, don't kill, don't go to war. There are other ways that church would be shut down. Any church that would carry out true religious teachings would have a very limited following. Absolutely. They, they have to survive in the monetary system just like every other group, and it's obviously very transparent to most people that that establishment is extremely manipulated and is no different than really a corporation at this point. Peter, everything that the establishment touches becomes corrupt. Right. When a doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out, we don't know if he's not trying to pay off a new boat he bought or, or a new house he bought. It's very hard in the monetary system to understand the intentions of people. Yes. You know, I got sure. just the car you're looking for. <laughs> in other words, take an honest Christian who works in a department store, and a woman, say, wants to buy a lamp for $20. If he's honest, he said, look, if you go next door, you can get the same lamp for $15. How long do you think he'd be working for that company? You see, it's very difficult in this system to be decent and fair. Yes, yeah, so I, I absolutely... Or any monetary system. It just does not promote those conditions by the nature of the established society. Yes, yes, and it's amazing how people seem surprised when we have corrupt politicians taking bribes, and they seem surprised when we go to war for resources and it becomes quite transparent. And there's a great deal of naivety, I think, out there, wouldn't you say, with the general population, because they really believe most of them you, in you this You can't system. manipulate people unless they're naive. Right, right. Remember when in the days of slavery, if you taught your slave how to read, you were fined. Well, you see, if you educate people, you can't control them. Yes, yes. So there's, there's the answer. 
if, if those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, if you contact the Venus Project, we have uh, many books that you can get hold of that describe how this system works, which is not in all your public libraries. It is not in your schools. It is not in your universities. I can name a whole batch of books that you never heard of that really describe the way our country operates. Yes, yes, and I recommend the reading list to everybody, and they should definitely yes, get your do. books. And Yes, absolutely. Also, I recommend people to get books and put them in libraries. People have been putting my movies in libraries, school libraries. I think it would be great to donate have your books donated to uh, to local libraries too? So that I would be wonderful. You. Yes. Great. Actually, the reading list is on our blog, and you can get direct links right to Amazon to purchase them. I think uh, that information in your book is is wonderful. That's definitely a great starting point for people to learn about this stuff. I want to rephrase my uh, my prior question. You had mentioned before that the only real threats to humanity are threats that are common to all people. That's disease, heart disease, cystic fibrosis, degeneration of the retina, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods. This is what we should be working on. The threat to mankind, not, not other nations, not killing people, but preservation of the environment, restoring it, rebuilding the reefs, removing the pollution that we dumped into the ocean. All ships pump their bills, oil out into the ocean and lots of garbage and waste. We depend on the ocean for survival. We are really killing ourselves due to the fact that the public is not educated in the real essence that supports survival for all people. That's a major threat, irrelevant education. Yes, I think uh, you also mentioned that the, one of the greatest resources on this planet is really the human mind, and that's something people don't think about. They don't realize that our the human mind is really the most powerful aspect, and we've been abusing that. We don't take care of our culture. Right. Well, look, whenever they turned to science and said we need an atom bomb, they were able to come up with it. Too bad they weren't wise enough not to give it to the military. They would not use it intelligently. See, even the scientists today, lots of them are patriotic. Same with Germany. When Hitler got into power, many scientists fell in line. Very few actually left. So you see, even in the Axis power, scientists are brought up with loyalty to their particular country. A real scientist would have loyalty to the Earth and our resources and all the people on it, not any single nation, because we owe so much to so many other countries, like an Arab named Algebra gave us Algebra, and a guy, a Frenchman named Louis Pasteur, Maybe if it weren't Pasteur, we'd all be dead. So how can you uphold any single country when the contributions that made us great in whatever way we are great comes from all over the world? The ideas come from all over the world. The printing press, Germany. Is it an American invention? The Chinese had kind of a rudimentary form of motion picture 600 years ago to 1,000 years ago. So you think that everything you use is American. You're not given the truth. And the, the book called The New American History, which is very difficult to get hold of, gives you a lot of information along the lines I'm talking about. So as long as you keep people from knowing what you call the truth, you can control them. All societies are controlled. I'm not upholding any particular society. They're all corrupt as long as they use money as long as they have politics. With politicians, never gave us a better electric light or a method of inoculation to cut down the amount of diseases in the country. They never designed hospitals for people. They made no contributions at all except verbal things. They like religion. They give lip service to the Christ principles. And I think Christ said, by their work, you shall know them. So here we go into a building and say, may we live in peace. May we have eternal brotherhood. But if you don't do anything about it, you just have a verbal hobby, which I call most established religions are a verbal hobby and have nothing to do with the teachings of the wisest people that ever lived. 
Absolutely. Uh, applied spirituality, I think, would be a good term. And unfortunately, most in our, you know, pseudo spiritual and and I like the term you use, applied yes, spirituality. That's good. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a that's a great way to think about it. That's certainly what I try to use as, as a form of terminology. Because you're you're absolutely right. It's amazing to me how we favor certain individuals that, of course, are very giving, like Mother Teresa, but yet we don't pay attention to the Louis Pasteurs and the people that have actually contributed to save millions and millions of lives. So they also romantic- say, what would motivate people if you take away money? Well, I don't trust people motivated by money. Gandhi worked for nothing. Martin Luther King worked for nothing. And people that really love the world, Jesus never got paid for what he did. He chased the money changers out of the temple. And when he did, he used profanity. He didn't say, will you kindly leave? He chased them out, upset their tables, and now they're all back in full control. But really, if you understand what I'm talking about, we don't want to hurt anybody, kill anybody, build any prisons, or use police. We want to make it unnecessary for people to steal so they have access to medical care, health care, decent housing, all people all over the world. As long as you don't share your resources, you're going to have trouble. As long as you maintain ownership, too, there'll be problems and laws to keep people who own things in power. And if you really are honest about your religious beliefs, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no money in heaven, no business, no private ownership. What do you think we're talking about? What do you think the Venus Project is? It's a translation of all the world's religions into a way of life rather than lip service. Absolutely, and that is uh, precisely what I hope people get out of this that are religiously oriented, is that uh, while they might have disputes on specifics, until you engage a world where people actually have reciprocal caring for one another and they share what they have, it's all, again, lip service, and I I completely agree with you. I wanted to ask you, um, I got a question regarding cultural diversity. There's many people that believe that things, humans might be too similar or everything might look the same in sort of like a 1984 type of environment. What can you say about cultural diversity in the future? Well, we would have courses in creative thinking. We have courses in art and music. And creativity will be the keynote of the future, giving people the methods and means for becoming creative. I think everybody is really creative, but not given the opportunity to become so. Children always ask great questions, and we destroy their inquiry when they're very young. They say things like, well, why do people live in those old broken houses, Daddy? And Daddy says, well, that's the way the world is. And they kill incentive in children. Children ask very good questions. And so, in the future, no one will be in charge of a fixed point of view are we will always be emerging into new dimensions of thinking the broadest range possible. We will encourage all people to become creative in the arts and sciences. This is the keynote of the Venus Project, creativity. And also you have to remember that it's not what people wear or their clothing or their hairdos or the the way they dance that makes them individuals. It's how you think and how creative one is. I always say to people when they ask that, well, do you think Jacques is creative or an individual? He's the most individual and creative person I know. He wouldn't come up with a society that would squelch that for everyone else. Of course, and he's not wearing uh, earrings, and he doesn't have tattoos. <laughs> and that is, that is unfortunately the vanity that we see in this culture, which just keeps growing every single year. And people have been brainwashed by the corporate industry to identify themselves with their property and the way they look. And I think that's a, that's a big hurdle, of course. And so I, know, I, All news is managed news. Sure. You get what they want you to hear. You really don't have news on your broadcasting or your newspapers. Who gives a damn if somebody is getting a divorce, a movie star, or she becomes pregnant because she's not, and she's not married? Who gives a damn about those things? That's irrelevant. It's a sick society that supports that. That belongs in a psychological journal, not in the newspapers. That's a fantastic point. I I couldn't agree more. 
I couldn't agree more. I had a technical question. Somebody wanted some clarification on the carrying capacity of the Earth as it relates to technology. And what they're asking is, does the carrying capacity increase as technology advances? Well, the carrying capacity of the Earth is fixed, but the ability of technology to solve problems and generate substitute materials that we're running out of. In other words, if we run out of certain kinds of materials, science usually is capable of coming up with a substitute. Just as we blockaded Germany from getting rubber from Sumatra, the Germans invented a synthetic rubber. So they had their jeeps and vehicles all equipped with rubber. If you have a good technical staff, you can solve problems. But technical staffs don't always have the necessary appropriations to do the research they want to do. Remember that labs today do not have the appropriations necessary to do the kind of research they want to do. In the Venus Project, we would make all things available. Whatever they required, we would make available. And there wouldn't be patents or proprietary technology which holds creativity and advancement back. But all inventors and all people would be cared for, so they need not be hungry anymore. Artists need not starve and paint pictures. All of that garbage that goes along with the monetary system. Someday, you know, children will ask their parents, couldn't you see that the monetary system generated both incentives and corruption and embezzlement and taking care of your brother-in-law and falsifying information in advertising and everything else? Wasn't that obvious, Daddy? And Daddy would say, well, well, we didn't know that at that time. We didn't have that kind of information. And the child would say, but wasn't it obvious? Because children of the future will not be educated as they are today to learn things that are totally irrelevant. Dickie Dare and the sheep on the way they met a cow. Moo Moo said the cow. Ba Ba said the sheep. You fill kids' heads with nonsense. Let me say this clearly. Children can learn geology, reforestation. They can learn the ocean sciences, marine biology. They can learn anything just as fast as you give them the Mickey Mouse Club. You are harming people when you do that. You hold them back. Children can learn anything. It's all in your head that you think they need for you to say, look at the little birdies singing. The birds don't sing. They make certain sounds. We call it singing. Birds are not singing. The world you live in is as full of shit as a Christmas turkey. <laughs> well put, well put. And I completely agree. But it I, gives I them a good start when they learn reality instead of having to undo all the, the fairy tales that they learn. And the, the, the stories that they learn when they're young are, are horrifying. You know, um, That's true. Witchcraft and the stuff that kids read today, right. And then you motion pictures today, which is the same story over and over again. And they even try to make movies about the future. You know what they've got in those movies? Cowboys in space with laser guns shooting people, dissolving other spaceships. That's not the future. That's the psychopath's notion of the future. Yes. It's a free enterprise system brought into the future. Yes. Well, I'm still amazed, even right now, as to, to the fact that no positive film has ever come out about the future, and everything is always negative, everything is post-apocalyptic, or, as you put it, absolutely absurd. Why do you feel that the perception of the future has to be negative? Because most people you meet, they tend to feel this way. Do you have any people will make that? demands on society if they saw the truth, Good and point. they couldn't maintain the established system. If you ran a movie on the future and kept it fairly close to the pro probable state of technology, people would come out of the theater and say, why don't we have that now? Yes. Why are we struggling? Why do we go to work every day when we can automate and spend more time with our family? In other words, if the industry was sane and a new machine came in, they would say to the help, now you work four hours a day, you can have a one-month vacation instead of two weeks. That would be, no one would be against machines, but if they take in machines and they downsize, it's cheaper to get rid of you than to give you the benefits, and that's called the profit system. Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. It's unfortunate that everything is, as you said, ass backwards. That's the oh, way by the way, um, PJ, there are people that do wonderful things in industry, but they're out of business. Sure. No one will invest in a company that takes care of its health, that builds a playground for the children of the women that work there, or shares in the medical care for all the help. No one would invest in that company because the profit margin is lower. Do you understand that? Being yeah. a decent person is threatening in this kind of society, threatening to your perseverance and existence. Absolutely. It's a self-perpetuating corruption. There's really no place for someone to be honest, and I, I think that's a very radical realization for most people that I speak with because they, they just assume that it's pockets of corruption, and they don't understand that the entire thing is corrupt. It has to be to operate. Look, a lawyer is not out to help people with problems. They're out to make money. They don't consider people with problems. They don't care very, about the truth. Very few lawyers. There are good lawyers. One of the greatest was Clarence Darrow, but that's many years ago. There are few lawyers that do good work, but there are doctors that do good work. They're called Doctors Without Borders. They really save up money, work, and they go to undeveloped countries and treat people free of charge. This is the incentive I'm talking about, the real incentive, not the monetary incentive. That's a sick, warped incentive perpetuated by culture. Absolutely. I think Margaret Mead put it best when she said that the most rewarding actions that we have are the ones that help people, and they're not for monetary gain, and I think she was very right. And I think most deep down would agree with that. You have a lot of volunteerism in America and across the world, but unfortunately... Everyone's still trapped in their pockets of corruption. So, it's, uh, But I believe the precedent is, is there to a certain degree. I, I'm sure you've seen that. There are people out there that do want to help. And that do Not want only to that, but you take a very powerful person, say a very wealthy person worth billions of dollars. I would say they're mentally ill. I agree. You don't need billions of dollars to survive. In other words, the people we admire today are the sick people of the establishment that have accumulated a great deal of wealth, that shows you how distorted the world is today. We should admire, of course we admire people in the past that worked for nothing, that made contributions to society and spent their life trying to help people. These are the people we admire, but really after they die hundreds of years later. But today... We admire the wrong people, the wealthy and the powerful. The most greedy people are the people we admire. So our society is distorted, very distorted, and I feel sorry for the shape of the future if we continue along these lines. Yes, I, I, absolutely. And I think it, you made a great point to me last time I saw you where you commented that for someone to have billions of dollars is for them to consciously not want to care about all of those that die of starvation because they're withholding that money which could help. And that's something people don't often think about. That's a conscious withdrawal of efficiency. Right. They are hurting people because the more people out there working on heart disease, cancer, is for your benefit. When you deprive labs of the equipment they need, not money, the equipment, that's why we call it a resource-based economy. We provide labs with whatever they need because we have the resources, but we don't have enough money to build hospitals all over the world, but we have more than enough resources. Yes, and that's, that's the, the great realization. Absolutely. Um, on a practical note, I wanted to bring this up because I think we have a very large audience today. And have you had any luck with having people help render some of your work? Because I wanted to throw this out there to people. We're, we're very lucky to have a very large base of very honest, dedicated people that uh, really want to really want to push forward with, with this social direction. So hopefully very soon we can do that as well. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Is there anything you guys uh, want to say in, in conclusion? You're right. That's what it takes to change things. In other words, Roxanne and I have no power at all. It's you people out there, if you understand what I'm talking about, do something about it. Don't sit down and make a verbal hobby of it. 
In other words, if you really believe in the world and people, we can save it. It depends on what you do, not what Roxanne and I. We spend all our time, and PJ spends all his time trying to enlighten people. So it's what you do that counts. Don't put it all on us. People send us continuous advice as to what to do. We're up to our necks in answering email, and we're just two people, and we have to maintain 22 acres and mow the grass and write the scripts and shoot the pictures and build the models and write the manuscripts and do books and publications. That's just Roxanne and I and PJ doing all this work. We need your help and participation. That's what will make the transition. Otherwise, there won't be one. I couldn't agree more, and that's one of the main things I attempt to advocate as much as possible is that we have put this information out there, and people need to get as educated as they can and begin to take their own actions. And even if you have a 9-to-5 job, you can find an hour or two a week to help promote this direction in whatever way you can. So, right. so I can put it another way. I really don't want people to follow me. I don't want to build a following. Sure. I want people to listen to what I say. If it makes sense, do it. That's all the future is about, what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, that's the uh, best way to go. And people need to begin to really think for themselves as well, which is, of course, very important, using these tools that we're, we're putting out there. So, excellent. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter, for the opportunity. It. I appreciate this. Absolutely, Noah. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. And uh, I'll see you guys uh, very soon. And have a wonderful uh, rest of the weekend. You too. Thanks a lot, okay. Peter. And have a wonderful life as well. That's right. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.